Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Today, I'm joined by Daniel Bessner, Associate Professor of International Studies at the University of Washington and the co-host of the new podcast, American Prestige, which I've really been enjoying, so I encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, and we're going to be talking about foreign policy under Biden, what's changed, what hasn't changed, and what should a foreign policy, a progressive foreign policy, I should say, look like. Daniel, welcome. Thank you uh, so much, Rania. It's really a pleasure to be here. I've been reading you and listening to you for a long time, so it's a genuine pleasure, and thank you so much for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. Well, the feeling is mutual, and so I'm so excited to have you on because I want to get your perspective on so many things related to foreign policy. Um, before I get into that, though, uh, I just want to remind all the viewers to click on the subscribe button uh, if you haven't already, and uh, for those who are listening to the show, you can watch every episode on YouTube on the Breakthrough News YouTube channel. And for those who are watching, you can listen to every episode of Rania Kalik Dispatches anywhere you get podcasts. So, Daniel, <laughs> um, you know, first, you know, I mentioned that you're hosting this new podcast, American Prestige. Um, and, you know, I'm in Beirut right now, and I was recently in Baghdad. And it seems like, at least from a Middle Eastern vantage point, American Prestige <laughs> is at an all-time low, right? So, and that's, you know, thanks to Bush, Obama, and then Trump. So why is it that, or in your, in your opinion, why is it that the U.S., more than I think any other country, is so obsessed with its prestige and credibility? And on top of that, you know, why did you decide to start your podcast now and why would this title American Prestige? I know that's like 12 questions in one, but they're all related. So feel <laughs> the, free they, to. They, they are all <laughs> related. So, uh, I mean, Derek and I just thought the podcast world needed two more white guys gabbing about <laughs> politics. So we wanted to fill that market gap. So that's the major reason. <laughs> uh, but in, in, in addition to that, um, we, you know, I, as you know, I, I mean, so much of the foreign policy discussion is incredibly stultifying. Um, there are a lot of assumptions, the most important of which are the assumption that the United States should dominate the world. Um, and that the United States could dominate the world um, and through military hegemony, uh, uh, military globalism, and also dollar supremacy. And so just having those assumptions really leads one down certain paths that, that uh, myself and Derek, we, we find uh, incredibly damaging. So our podcast starts from the assumption that, you know, what if that wasn't the case? What if the United States shouldn't dominate the world? What if, you know, as a leftist, you adopt a more humanistic perspective where you view every human life? <gasps> life I know, it's such a shock. <laughs> Every human yeah. life is philosophically and morally equal. And so those are basically the assumptions um, from which we start. And if those are your philosophical uh, presumptions, and you actually wind up going down different foreign policy paths. So I think that's that's one of the major things. Now, it's really interesting. Why does the United States care so much about its prestige? Um, one thing, you know, some people might argue, and I think this is to a certain degree true, that all great powers that want to have, you know— Re either regional hegemony or global hegemony, which I think the United States is only the one, the, the only real power that really wants global hegemony. But let's just say that they they they, they want you know to be loved in a certain de uh, to a certain degree. They want to win the hearts and minds of the population. Um, I do think it has a peculiarly sort of intense valence in the United States related to sort of like the liberal, uh, again, belief that, you know, they can't believe that they're doing such good for the world and that people don't yeah. embrace them. Uh, and, and by liberal, I don't mean Democratic Party. I mean, like, you know, liberalism writ large. And I think to a certain right. degree, the bipartisan foreign policy establishment is liberal writ large and they want to be loved and they can't uh, imagine why, why they aren't. <laughs> and so I think you get that peculiar, um, you know, obsession with being with being liked, even though the United States, I would say empirically and historically has done such incredible damage to the world. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sitting in a part of the world that's received a lot of that damage. And so I, I want to go to one one area in the Middle East. Um, you know, when it comes to foreign policy, it seems like there's so little that differentiates Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but, you know, the Iran nuclear deal was this one thing that seemed like it really drew this clear distinction between them. You know, since Trump ripped it up and Obama had worked so hard on, on bringing it about. And, you know, I'll even say, like, I was of the belief uh, uh, before this presidential election between Biden and Trump, I was of the belief that Biden, if he won, would come into office and actually go back to that deal, like, really quickly. But of course, you know, since they've, then they've been really dragging their feet, they've kept all the sanctions on. 
And I mean, you know, there was this report yesterday in Iran and one person is dying every two minutes from COVID. And I, you know, last, last April, uh, April of 2020, uh, during the campaigning for presidency, Biden actually said, and this is a direct quote from him. He said, our sanctions are limiting Iran's access to medical supplies and needed equipment. And Trump, the Trump administration should take immediate steps to address, address this, whatever our disagreements with the Iranian government. It's the right and humane thing to do. Um, and of course, nothing has changed. The sanctions have remained in place. In fact, the Treasury Department has even placed more sanctions on certain Iranian officials. So it seems to me like regardless of what happens between Washington and Tehran, including in the current Vienna talks under Biden, there's this kind of inevitable confrontation looming between the U.S. and Iran. And if it doesn't happen under Biden, I'm talking about some sort of, you know, more serious warfare, that it will happen under a future president like Nikki Haley or something, um, or whoever is <laughs> yeah. going to be, you know, coming down the line in 2024. It's as if the U.S. is, you know, simply just can't tolerate an Iran that isn't subjugated. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I, I don't think there'll be an invasion. I think a lot would have to happen for there to be an invasion. But you c you could see things like the Soleimani thing, you yeah. know, uh, or, or the assassination of Iranian nuclear scientists, which has been going on for a very long time. Um, so, uh, I yeah, I think that there's uh, there's a lot of reasons behind it. I mean, you could go really deep, which is that I, 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 I don't mean to be too crude about it. But from the beginning of the United States' history, you know, white lives uh, mattered more than non-white lives. And you see, you know, indigenous populations population displacement, you see the subjugation of the Philippines, you see the incarceration of Japanese citizens, you see the fact that, you know, most of the United States' Cold War wars um, happened in Asia, you know, the, mm -hmm. the sort of the, the Pacific Rim area, uh, where millions upon millions of people died, um, in, and died and were deracinated in Korea and Vietnam, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, you already have like, you know, it's, uh, the Iranians aren't sort of like the right racial makeup. So like, right. that's a very deep thing. Uh, and then you have the humiliation or the perceived humiliation of 79, of 78-79, you know, the Iranian Revolution, which overthrew the Shah, who, of course, I'm sure people listening to this know, was a, a, a leader that was put up by the United States after the uh, deposal of Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. And so, you, you know, this very close ally who Iran very close to the United States for a lot of the 20th century until 79, it sort of turned on a dime. Uh, you also have, you know, the, the implicit and explicit U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and Saudi regional hegemony. Um, and so there's just a lot working against, um, you know, the United States is, I mean, it, it's, I, I think a lot of the United States is fault, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, against the United States adopting, you know, a, a sane policy toward Iran. I mean, and you saw it with Biden, just like Trump took, uh, everyone out of the JC, uh, took the U S out of the JCPOA, the joint comprehensive plan of action, the Iran nuclear deal, Biden could have immediately got back into that thing. Um, right. you know, but he, he decided not to. And now with the Iranian elections, it's very difficult, uh, to do uh, to do that as well. So I just think there's no there's no interest uh, within the United States uh, to come to some sort of detente, a genuine detente with Iran. And you were talking about, about medical supplies. Um, and this is Asal Rod's statistic, I believe. And uh, Asal, if I'm quoting this incorrectly, I apologize. But Iran, I think, produces 97 percent of its own medical supplies, but it relies. Um, but those three percent of supplies are very specialized. And so mm -hmm. those are, you know, I, I think Asal was talking about like it's like chemo medicine, you know, and yeah. COVID medicine. So it's like very, um, you know, medicine that are absolutely crucial to the continued survival of individual people that the United States, again, because it just doesn't value non-American lives and <laughs> to the degree it values American lives may also be in question, but it certainly doesn't value non-American lives in, in, uh, in a very high way. And so I think all these things, you know, lead to these weird situation, this, this bad situation that the U.S. has with Iran and has had for decades at this point. Yeah, and then it, it seems to be like this kind of, you know, you mentioned that you can't foresee any sort of invasion, and I can't either. I think that that era, at least, is is over for now of the U.S. actually be like taking its military and invading a country, um, and it seems to have really replaced those kinds of tools purely with this economic warfare of sanctions. And of course, it's not just Iran, right? It's also, and this has been ramped up under Biden in some of these places, but it's Cuba, it's Venezuela, um, it's Syria, uh, where you know I recently been talking to a lot of people who work in various NGO capacities in Syria. And, you know, the sanctions are so severe, they can't even get fuel to farmers to just do basic agriculture, which is actually quite frightening because then it, it makes a, 
makes it harder for the country to produce food, which is essential. Um, and you have a lot of rising malnutrition, but it does seem like this, you know, this, this turn towards sanctions, which Trump really ramped up and now Biden is, is, is ramping up to some degree even more, you know, Biden goes around saying like, he doesn't want state collapse. At least his officials do. They don't want state collapse anymore in the middle East. Uh, they want to see stability, but what I'm seeing around me with these sanctions is the actual impact of them is kind of the same as war. Um, in, some, in some cases, if you ask people living in places like Syria or even Lebanon that's experiencing a lot of the same uh, impact or a lot of the same problems as Syria, though it's not just because of sanctions, it's it's more, you know, a lot of other issues, it's a bit more complicated. But people will tell you that it's actually like more difficult to live without electricity like this because you can't get fuel and without access to medication than it is to live with just some people fighting in a couple neighborhoods down the street from you because at least you still have electricity and medicine and the war is going to be over at some point. This kind of seems like it's never ending. So, I mean, what do you make of that? Do you think that this, that this tool of sanctions, has it, does it seem to have replaced the sort of like invading explicit, just constant bombing kind of stuff? Does it seem to have replaced that as the American primary method of warfare and I guess like state collapse and regime change? And do they even mean it to do that? I think it has. And I think you could understand sanctions as being part of this broader turn to, toward a cleaner and lighter footprint war. You see, you know, with drones and Waziristan or the, you know, the use of special forces and the fact that they moved through something like three fourths of the world's countries in 2017. Uh, the United and, and this is this is actually part of a larger process that I think has been going on for a long time. Um, and I write a little about it in a forthcoming New Republic piece that, that I'm referring to as the demassification of war, that um, mm. during the Vietnam War uh, in 1973, Congress refused to extend the draft and it established what's referred to as the all-volunteer force, the AVF, which just means that the bourgeoisie no longer fights America's wars, that you could essentially you know, rule uh, through technology, uh, which got better and better and better, and precision weapons and things like that. You could govern the world, if you're the United States, through, through light footprint. So you could essentially remove politics from war in a real way. And even when you think about uh, Iraq, it's a much lighter footprint war than than World War II, for example. Right. And, and that's only within 70 years, um, less than that, 65 years, 68. But um, so I think that you have this this broader demassification of which this is a process. And economic warfare is part of that. It's part of the fantasy, again, the liberal fantasy of, of clean war, that you're going to be able to dominate the world uh, through imperialism, but a clean imperialism. And that really, as you suggested, is just a total fantasy. Um, economic warfare, economic sanctions, uh, you, even you know a lot of the targeted sanctions really winds up harming the entire population of these particular regions. And so um, I think that uh, it's part of this, this failed fantasy uh, of global domination that could be in some way humane. Uh, so one of the things that I think like the left could do is basically highlight that it's really impossible for there to be a form of clean warfare, or that, you know, mm -hmm. imperialism is inherently unclean and evil, and that it, it winds up getting your hands dirty and your hands bloody. And that is the fundamental fact that I think people need to begin to recognize across the political spectrum. Yeah, I think with sanctions, it's also more difficult to get people even on the left really riled up about it, because it's like, it's not this sensationalism of like, bombs falling and people getting limbs blown off. It's really this more gradual process of just like shattering a country from the inside out and uh, stripping it of the basic services that it needs. And you can't really see it uh, unless you're there experiencing it. And even, you know, in a lot of these countries, like there is a certain class of people that uh, are sort of immunized from the impacts of sanctions, because I mean, if you have money, if you have dollars, right, to buy fuel. The global bourgeoisie, right? Like, I mean, right. Marx predicted this. There really is, in a real mm -hmm. way, you know, uh, rich people in New York and let's say New Delhi share more in common with each other than oh, they do yeah. poor people of a population. And that's a unique thing, right? And so you have this weird situation where you have these like transnational class formations existing within a nation state, um, uh, a nation state polity that like they, they don't experience things equally. And I think that's really important to underline. No, totally. And I, I, I think, you know, I, what's interesting, too, about the impact of these sanctions is um, and this is this is true of so much American foreign policy. And I'm not sitting here trying to, like, advise America on how to be a better imperial power. But <laughs> if I was an imperialist, um, I would I would care about the impact of these sanctions in the sense that you can only use them to a certain degree 
before you start pushing a lot of countries in the world to almost form like a group where they can exist outside of the dominance of the US dollar. Um, and what I mean by that is you do see these sanctions countries turning to who? Turning to America's biggest adversaries like Russia and China. I personally don't care that they are, but I don't know why American imperialists don't care that they are, but th that brings me to the issue of China. So, you know, why, why do you think the US feels this, this imperative to confront China rather than cooperate with it? Even, you know, even political thinkers like, like Mearsheimer, for example, who I think a lot of us enjoy for his calls on realism on issues like, you know, Russia and the U.S. relationship with Israel. But even he still thinks that the U.S. has to confront China. Like there's this deeply embedded belief of really across the political spectrum. Um, so I guess, yeah, what, what's your take on that? Why is it so necessary for so many of these Americans even intellectuals, like they feel that we have to confront China. It's funny you mentioned Mersheimer because he and I were sitting next to each other at a luncheon a couple of years ago, and this is what we talked about for an hour and mm. a half. And I'm like, why do you think we need to confront China? And essentially, for Mersheimer, I would say like literally it's an ontological belief. It's, it's, a, it's a faith in how world politics works. And he's – let's see how old John Mersheimer is. He By the way, I totally, is, I totally butchered his name, but I'm allowed to because people butcher my name all the time. So it's – allowed I, yeah, people just sometimes call me. Uh, this is true. People sometimes call me just Josh or David. I wonder what they're trying to express there. Um, <laughs> I actually heard you say that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay though. Like it's allowed. Times. Like when you have such yeah. a, a common, you know, white boy name, it's okay for people to call you other names. That yeah, uh, tri tri triple parentheses, Josh or David. But uh, so, oh, <laughs> uh, the Jewish white boy thing. There got it, it is. got it. So, uh, so <laughs> Mersheimer's 73 years old, right? So Mersheimer grew up in a particular age where there were particular assumptions about international politics. And as a realist, he's shaped by a generation of people who came of age in the 1930s and 1940s who thinks international, who thought, uh, and a lot of realists continue to think, and this is where I really disagree with them. Um, I actually wrote an article about this called Foreign Policy for the 21st Century in Boston Review. But they basically believe that international politics is inherently conflictual and that you'll always have great power and they'll always fight with each other. And that, I think, is because IR as a field was developed in response to Hitler. And so mm -hmm. you have a lot of assumptions about international politics that were literally formulated in the 1930s. And these assumptions about what international politics, capital I, is – emerge from that decade. And I just think that's fundamentally ahistorical and fundamentally wrong. I mean, I think most of the time, actually, you don't have a Hitler. You don't have someone at the head of a major industrial state basically willing to commit geopolitical suicide by fighting a two-front war. That usually doesn't happen, actually. So I think a lot of those fundamental assumptions wind up distorting geopolitical analysis. And that's what I think is happening to, to, to John Mersheimer. I think that he's assuming international politics is something that I don't necessarily think it is. Um, and I think that also relates to U.S. foreign policy. I think a lot of the assumptions about what international politics is are, are inertial. They're, they, they're, they're pushed forward by an inertia that was formed in the institutions and ideas that were made during the Cold War. If you think about all the yeah. institutions that still make foreign policy, the National Security Council, the CIA, the Department of Defense, these are all Cold War institutions that have embedded within them certain ideas about, again, what international politics is. And so you see it happen over the course of the American century, which Henry Luce, the publisher, declared in, in, in the 40s during World War II. You see how uh, you, it starts with the Nazis. The mm -hmm. Nazis then become the Soviets. The Soviets then become in the 1990s when we were kids, genocide. You know, like the U.S. is going to stop genocide. 9-11, uh, the greatest gift to the foreign policy establishment. You have Islam, you know, become and you have the use of Hitler analogies, et cetera, et cetera. And now you have China. Right. So mm -hmm. you just see how you basically see over the course of the American century, the identification of new existential enemies that basically just support the structures of the American empire that continue to exist. Um, so I think that's really the major reason why um, these a lot of people, even people, you know, broadly on the what's called the restrainer uh, side, um, which is not a name I love. Um, it's kind of a BDSM quality to it. Uh, uh, but you see uh, a lot of people on the restrainer side, essentially um, assuming China is, if they, even if they don't use these words and even if they'd use more nuance on it, it's equivalent to the Soviet Union and ultimately equivalent to Nazi Germany. It's a great power that has designs on the world. Also, I think that American Protestantism plays a role here. I think there's an inherently universalizing quality to American political culture that emerges from the Protestant um, 
the Protestant origins of this country. Uh, so uh, you you have this universalizing global uh, global quality to how Americans understand the world that they then in, then impute or project on other powers. You saw this in in the in the Cold War and particularly in George Kennan's long telegram when he said that Marxism Leninism is a global ideology that is global designs. I thought that was you know mostly projection. You think about Stalin; he was talking about socialism in one country in the 1920s. It's not exactly a secret. The uh, Soviet Union didn't have the power to do it. Um, um, right. But I think you, you see the imputation of this idea onto other great powers when really, empirically, historically, I mean, everyone kind of has to agree this is a fact. There's been one global empire in human history, and it's been the United States. There's one mm-hmm. country that has 750 about bases, and it is the United States. Um, so I think all those things work together to wind up to this sort of like new Cold War rhetoric with China. Of course, it's different because the political economies of the U.S. and China are much more embedded than the U.S. and Soviet Union ever were. So I don't think you could ever have quite the same thing. But you could use this as a logic to, you know, re-strengthen the military-industrial complex, re-strengthen the military-intellectual complex, basically forever. Yeah, and of course, there's also the added issue of, you know, wanting to have this sort of unipolar world forever where it's just American dominance and there's this fear. I mean, China's economy is rising. Like We've all seen these sort of, you know, Defense Department white papers about China's economy being a huge threat to the Americans because it's going to overtake it. But You know, another aspect of that sort of, you kind of went through this timeline of these foundational ideologies that offer the intellectual framework for American empire and imperialism. And you mentioned the Cold War era with the Soviets uh, and the sort of genocide, you know, 90s, it was all genocide, whether we're talking about, you know, Serbia or, uh, you know, well, Rwanda, we didn't intervene. But, you know, the issue was everywhere there's genocide and we have to stop it. Uh, The rise of the Samantha, Samantha Power Age. Um, and then it became 9-11 and the war on terror. And you've actually uh, written about this before. You know, now a lot of, I, I think there's a few different sort of uh, intellectual frameworks for this us versus them kind of mentality. But now it seems to be more and more this issue of authoritarianism and, and corruption. This is what I see a lot more uh you know, being used as this kind of, you know, it's being used obviously very selectively and hypocritically only against American adversaries, never against American allies. Saudi Arabia Um, isn't corrupt, right? Saudi Arabia is okay. It's, it's, you know, they're reforming, right? Like MBS is a reformer. He might chop up a guy every once in a while, but he's moving in the right direction. He's liberalizing. Exactly. Women can drive, I think. I don't know. Uh, Yeah, I think, yeah, (laughs) back and forth on that one, yeah. But it, it seems to me this kind of very neoconservative formula, the sort of pro-democracy, pro-freedom, you know, uh, idea versus us versus them mentality is helping fuel American imperialism now. And it's really useful against China uh, as this kind of foundational framework that I see a lot of liberals and even some progressives falling into the authoritarianism, like fear mongering and even Bernie Sanders. Like, I think that was the point that you made in one piece you wrote where it was kind of like warning about falling into this trap of, of, you know, pro, you know, pro democracy versus authoritarianism, which we saw Bernie Sanders start to do a little bit. Yeah. And I, I'd like to think that I had an effect on, on Bernie because he did stop talking about that relatively quickly. He, he had a, this, this big speech uh, and that that's actually what I wrote that article in response to. And he, he did stop. He did stop um, about that. But no, I think that's that's absolutely right. And this is, of course, a very powerful rhetoric from the early Cold War. Um, it actually comes, ironically, from a Henry Wallace speech in 1944, Century of the Common Man. <laughs> he talks about the free world and the slave world. And he was talking about not in terms of geopolitics. Wallace, I don't think, would have had as much of a, a Cold War with the Soviet Union, um, as uh, maybe not even a, at all. But anyway, this is adopted by the American state in the 1950s, and you have the free world versus the unfree world, the free world versus the slave world, and you have the division of the world into these Manichaean frameworks of good versus evil. And it provides a very powerful... Um, rhetorical form to liberals because one of liberalism's basic premises is that they're forcing the world to... to, to, um uh, to, to progress, right? And this is when I say, I oftentimes refer to the uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, world as progressive. I don't mean the way we use it, like lower ca- uh, l- lowercase p, I mean capital P, turn of the century progressive mm. movement, because basically that was the idea that the government would be able to transform first national politics and then through Woodrow Wilson, and I would argue the formation of the national security state, 
international politics would be able to push a world in a particular direction. But I would say what the last 75 years have demonstrated is that um, politics just doesn't work that way. It's not like a, a turnkey. You can't manipulate it like you would a sort of mechanical system. And that was the metaphor that was often used. Um, so I think that is what that rhetoric is ultimately steeped in. And I think it provides, again, sucker to uh, American imperialists who essentially want to create this d divided world in order to justify an imperialism that has failed over and over and over again. And it's also so, you know, what, what I really dislike about it is it it's like only certain freedoms matter. Like, it because I, I feel like there's certain aspects of America that are quite authoritarian, especially economic aspects of it, right? Like, I actually have this, this real, I feel terrorized about the idea of moving back to the U.S. and having to deal with healthcare. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, that to me just feels like this, like, I can't breathe panicked kind of like lack of freedom. And I don't, you know, and obviously I know why, but at the same time, I don't know why we don't add that into the box of like the rights that we say people should have. Well, I, you know, obviously there's a reason why. And I, I but, think the cold war is actually crucial here because before world war two, uh, and I work about on this in my academic work before world war two, there's a much more expansive definition of, of freedom to include not political freedom, but also social freedom, economic freedom, to a certain degree, cultural freedom. It's really in over the course of the 30s, 40s and 50s that freedom is defined down as essentially the right to vote. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about the, the world we grew up in, like what is the ultimate expression of American politics? It's casting a ballot for who who your leader is, who which mm -hmm. elite is going to govern you. That's a very What's thin different? definition of freedom. And so I think you have this, I, the, 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 this, you know, the Cold War is really the worst thing to ever happen to American civil liberties and the American left because it provided a situation that many people could see at the time as being an emergency situation. And so you have the thinning out of a lot of ideas that before World War II were really expansive. And I think this idea of freedom as being basically the right to vote and the right to have access to a capitalist press is what it means to be free in the United States. And there were basically global South pushing back against this over the course of history. There's a new international economic order. And even more importantly, uh, you're a journalist. I don't know. You probably never even heard of this, the new international and communication order, which was something in the 1970s when a lot of global South powers got together and they essentially mm. said a capitalist press can never be free because they relied on on Western, a the, the AP, the German one, Reuters, right? These are all the, the French one. These are all Western new news sources, right? And they were like, these wire services are totally capitalist and totally yeah. imperialist. Right. So they tried to create another, you know, a new communications order. It failed because of dominance in American imperialism. But I do think it's important to emphasize that there are other ways of viewing things that basically take a more expansive definition of freedom that actually highlight the problems with things like a capitalist press, with things like equating freedom with voting. Right, right. And that's, I mean, that's a really excellent point, because also when it comes to voting, it's like how... How free is it really when it's just pre-approved candidates all the time? And it's like you have to pull out – it's like pulling out teeth and bending over backwards just to get somebody who isn't funded by like every pharmaceutical company <laughs> on a ballot, right? Um, but, you know, I, I – to, to go off of that and the issue of this kind of like multipolar versus unipolar world, um, do you think that we're looking at a period of permanent U.S. decline and – does that lead to a multipolar world or to a world without poles at all, you know, just chaos, which there are, you know, some people who believe that? Well, there's a couple of things. One, um, I haven't thought enough about this, but it's it, it might be interesting in the next few years of like us on the progressive left. We, we begin moving beyond the idea of like world politics as a vacuum that's filled by power, which, mm -hmm. again, is an idea that emerges in the 1930s. And uh, again, I'm not sure that actually reflects what's going on there. Power is distributed in very ways. So, so, but that that is a caveat. But uh, that's still the framework we're working in, and uh, the one that I'm working in. And I would say we're in a unique situation, because if you look at previous empires like the Roman Empire, or the British Empire, or the Ottoman Empire, what happens is social decay at home makes it harder for the empire to function. Mm -hmm. But um, that demassification of imperialism, the demassification of war that I was talking about earlier actually means that the American empire doesn't need that many people to fight for it, to fight with it, um, right? If you're thinking about Rome, you need like the, the, the peasant farmers to come and literally be an army. If you're thinking about the British empire, you need people to staff the Royal Navy. You know, one guy could control a lot of drones, 
You know, uh, the, the, the bases don't need to be staffed by that many people. So we're in a unique situation in the sense that social decay at home, which I think is pretty inarguably happening, I think that's very clear, um, might not necessarily lead to imperial decay abroad. So you might have this very strange situation where you have a declining American society, but a still massively powerful American empire that could annihilate the world or at least deter uh, threaten, they refer to it as deterrence, threaten the world with atomic bombs. So uh, I think that we need to be thinking, you know, not for necessarily past examples, but how these new realities might affect American governance abroad. One thing that I do think is I don't think the U.S. will be able to remain hegemonic in East Asia. I think mm. that is almost certainly going to happen in the next 25, 30 years. It might be something dramatic like the crossing, the, the CCP crosses the China, uh, the Taiwan Straits. You know, I think Hong Kong was like kind of a test case to see what they could get away with. I don't think the United States is going to fight world war three over mm -hmm. taiwan um so if the american empire is smart what they would do is some sort of security transition you know with the bases surrounding china um or the power you know south korea philippines uh, australia indonesia etc but it's not smart what i what i think will happen is there'll be some crisis and the u.s will kind of just leave um and then it'll be up to the you know sort of middle powers in the region to do what they want to do so i do think the u.s won't be hegemonic in east asia but i do think it'll probably be hegemonic elsewhere uh for the foreseeable future yeah yeah, it definitely is like uh, really optimistic. <laughs> Sometimes like people, people really do believe the U.S. is in decline. It will in decline in the sense of like it's about to die. And it's just I just don't see that as the case around the world. I certainly no, think it'll not. be slightly less present in some places. And like you mentioned, East Asia being one of them and maybe maybe even the Middle East to some degree, though, not totally. Um I yeah, agree. You know, I think the Middle East, they'll get rid of, I think there'll be a significant drawdown in the Middle East, particularly as fossil fuels become less and less important to yeah. American allies. There's just no, it's like inertial, but there's such resistance everywhere for the U.S. presence in the Middle East. I think it'll be, uh, it'll it'll retreat. And the U.S. also has powerful client states in Saudi Arabia and Israel, right? It could, it could do a yeah. lot just through those two states. You know, and I actually think that retreat that you're talking about has already taken place to some extent. I mean, if you look at the number of American troops in Iraq, um, it's very few at this point. I think it's like altogether 2,500. Uh, there's like about 950 American troops in Syria, which they their presence is significant uh, in terms of them just being there, but it's not very many people. Um, and then, of course, you know, Afghanistan isn't really the Middle East, but at the same time, the U.S., you know, pretty much left Afghanistan. And what I actually think is um, a really reckless way in terms of the way the peace deal was done that really just kind of like threw the Afghan government under the bus and handed the country to the Taliban. But to, you know, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, I did, I'd love to get your perspective on this. Cause I find it interesting that, you know, there is, I'm very happy to see this antagonism towards forever wars, right? Um, people don't want, uh, you know, a lot of Americans don't want these wars to continue in the Middle East. They don't want American troops stationed in these places. And that was one of the drivers, I think, um, among other things, of Biden being able to leave Afghanistan. He also had to, you know, make good on what the, the, the deal that Trump made. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think the U.S. has been pulling out of Afghanistan for like the last eight years. Uh, but then you look at a place like Iraq and the U.S. just will not leave. Like, and that's a place where, you know, it's interesting with Afghanistan uh, on the government side, they're like begging America to stay. Like, please don't leave. The Taliban's going to take over. Whereas in Iraq, you know, having spent time there and I, I, I feel I understand the country pretty well. If the U.S. left, it really wouldn't make a difference security wise. Like ISIS isn't going to come back. Um, the U.S. is really just there to be, you know, to fight Iran, basically, to fight what they believed are Iranian-backed militias, and that's it. Um, so I just feel it's like, a, why is it that so much of the push to get America out of these forever wars was put towards Afghanistan and kind of everyone forgot about Iraq? I think it's as, as silly as it sounds. It's just because formally the Iraq war was over, has been over for a decade. And I mm. think that's that's the major reason uh, why they did that. I think that's it's really not more complicated than that. The Iraq war is done in a lot of Americans' minds. And again, because Americans don't need to care about foreign policy. They're not personally, they think they're not personally at least affected by it. So that makes it much less important for them to focus on. But Afghanistan, you ha still have the war going on. It's a 20 years war. It's, it's uh, you know, the longest war in American history. I mean, I guess it depends 
if you count the U.S. intervention in 54 in Vietnam or supporting of the French as being, you know, as starting the, the Vietnam War, it depends where you stay. But um, so I think that's basically it. I think that's the only reason why is that that was a settled problem. Obama ended the Iraq war and, and now we're done. Uh, as silly as that sounds, I think that's really the reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's so sad yeah it's very it's not, i mean it's, it's it's actually like it's it's so the the tit for tat that takes place there i mean sometimes wars can happen by accident um Leave it. and iraq really has become like a staging ground because of the u.s like ongoing hostilities with iran that it, you know there's it's just uh, there's actual a real actual danger that there could be an escalation in iraq and there already has been several times but you know, to catapult off that, I, I wanted to ask you this. Um, a friend of mine who was a longtime U.S. diplomat in the Middle East, you know, he recently, like, uh, in this group email we have, like, had, had talked about his time as a diplomat and how he really felt like a lot of what they were doing was being improvised along the way, um, which doesn't really comport with how, I mean, even I see foreign policy sometimes is so strategically planned in every like meticulous detail. So my question for you is, you know, how much of U.S. foreign policy is making it up as they go along? You know, a lot of people, like I mentioned, you know, sort of, you know, they think there's this plan, this strategy, but then when you sort of look inside the, sausage factory, if you will, you realize it's kind of a bunch of bureaucrats running around, at least abroad, running around soup, like cluelessly, cluelessly. And I've seen this. Um, but at the same time, obviously, they're serving this, this massive like behemoth. But yeah, how much of it is planned versus how much of it is just like, you know, as it goes, like improvising as you go? I mean, I think there's a ton of improvisation. I, I think that's almost undeniable. Uh, there's always been uh, a difficulty to control things from D.C. from a policy perspective. Uh, you could send orders out into the field, but what actually happens in the field on the ground is something that is very difficult to control. And this is a problem that the United States and basically all governments have when they're implementing a foreign policy. I think there's an enormous amount of, of, of I was going to say innovation, but I'm not sure that's the, you know, improvisation <laughs> is a better word. There's an enormous amount of improvisation on uh, on the ground, and particularly, uh, I think that's probably increased in recent years with Trump, right? With Trump, when you when you don't even have a strong head trying to oversee things, there's, I mean, who the fuck knows what the U.S. <laughs> military and the U.S. diplomatic corps did in during the Trump administration? Um, right. I mean, if they kept records, and and to be decided on that, but if they kept records, we'll, we'll one day find out. But I imagine there was a <laughs> lot of improvisation on the ground <laughs> yeah. that broadly related to to, to directives from D.C. and in, in in some vague sense. But there's just enormous latitude when people are, you know, thousands upon thousands of miles away from where the central directive is coming, even even within the the um, the embassies. Right. If you go out in the field, you know, there, there's difficulties of monitoring. So I would say just as a general principle, one should always assume that people on the ground in terms of policy are not necessarily doing what they want, but there is a significant degree of leeway that could be understood to uh, exist within the general strategic orders or, or tactical orders that they receive. Yeah, that makes sense from what I've watched happen in Lebanon, for sure. Um, now, I want to move to a Biden because, um, you know, he's been president for over half a year now. Um, and from how I see it, there's very little that I see that's really changed other than just r rhetoric. Um, obviously, there's some big things, right? Like when he came into office, he went back to. Um, you know, he, he, he went back to a bunch of treaties that Trump had broken. So the, the kind of bigger things like that changed a little bit, but as far as, you know, policies towards regions, I mean, Latin America looks, it, it, the policy hasn't changed. I mean, they still recognize Juan Guaido in Venezuela. They've ramped up sanctions on Cuba. Um, you know, everything that was happening under Trump is happening now. And, you know, with the Middle East, of course, you know, they, the maximum pressure campaign is still there, though maybe it's like not, you know, as they didn't crank up the the volume as high as it would have gone if Trump had had another term. And perhaps we would have had an, an actual war with Iran under a second Trump term. But for the most part, things in the Middle East haven't changed much. So and, you know, you re, you wrote a few months ago about Biden's foreign policy for Jacobin. And you wrote that Joe Biden's foreign policy isn't about democracy or human rights. It's about maintaining U.S. dominance. So my question for you is, can you elaborate a bit on that? And, you know, where where do you see differences between Biden so far and, and what was happening under the Trump presidency in terms of how they deal with the world? 
Right. So um, I think that I think that's right. The primary difference is rhetoric. I think that it, it's very difficult to to um, to find a genuine approach to the world in the Trump administration. I think the the foreign policy, at least, is that which was directed by Trump was was how he lived his life was it, which was in reaction to things that happened. Um, so you get you know the the mother of all bombs being dropped in Syria. You get the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, but you don't get any long term wars. You don't get any Libyas, for example, as, mm. as you had under Obama. Um, but I would say that all these presidents, as, as every president has since 1945, uh, again operate under the assumptions of, of, of hegemony and dominance. And that's true for Trump, and that's true for Biden. Uh, but I understand the Biden administration to be um, a pursuing a strategy of what, of what I've taken to call hegemonic stabilization, is that within the Biden administration, among the Antony Blinkens, among the Samantha, hmm. Samantha Powers, there's a recognition that it's not you know 1945 when the U.S. controlled 50% of world production, and it's not 1991 when there's literally no superpower to challenge the United States. There's, a, there's an understanding that the United States just doesn't have that sort of position of dominance that it did when Madeleine Albright called it the indispensable nation in 1998. That sees further into the future than other nations, uh, which was the quote. Um, you know, that's a paraphrase, but that's what she said, basically. Um, so I think there's a recognition that for the United States to maintain global dominance, what the administration is absolutely committed to, it's going to require some form of hegemonic stabilization. And you see that in Afghanistan, uh, you see that in Iraq, uh, and you see that with basically, I think, what you're, what you're going to see elsewhere, which is the removal of official representation representatives of the U.S. government and their replacement by things like contractors. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see the, the basically the um – the, the acceleration of the trends towards further to light uh, footprint wars that I talked about with drones and economic warfare and special forces, uh, accompanied by an increasing turn toward mercenaries, which has been happening, you know, for 20 years at this point. So you basically have the U.S. military serving as the training grounds for future mercenaries. You know, you go to basic, you, you, uh, you're deployed somewhere around the world, you do your whatever, five, 10 years, whatever it may be, and then you go and join... What, Black, the equivalent of Blackwater or something along those lines. And so you're going to have the United States, again, dominating the world through mercenaries. Um, and so that's a form of hegemonic stabilization in the sense that it's just moving foreign policymaking even further out of the public sphere. Uh, yeah. And I think you, I, there was a, a recent document that Biden received two days ago. We're going to talk about it on American Prestige, but it's like giving Israel like a blank check. You know, it's just the things that have always happened within the Biden, uh, within U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, um, or really since the Clinton administration are going to continue to happen. That That is what I think. Yeah. And it's, you know, when you talk about the moving, moving U.S. foreign policy out of the public sphere, ultimately that just like ends up leading to this kind of neoliberal rot that infects everything <laughs> that right. gets privatized. Um, and you see that so, in Saudi Arabia, you see that in the UAE, right? They were, what they're essentially trying to do is just become financial centers of that, of that region. Uh, you know, they, I think uh, MBS uh, appreciates that probably, you know, over time, you're not going to be able to rely on the extraction of oil. And so he's essentially trying to turn the country country into a financial center, right? And and, and yeah. a tourist center as well, right? I, I remember, I forget where I read it, but I remember hearing like there were discussions about open, opening Mecca to non-Muslims, um, I think, <laughs> which is like a gigantic shift, you know? Um, yeah. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens with things like that. But we're in a very transitional period. We're in the first post, post-Cold War order. You know, I actually think that, you know, what you just described used to be the model for Lebanon. Lebanon doesn't produce anything except for banks. That's all it used to produce before they came crashing down because it was just this massive Ponzi scheme. It was also completely dependent on tourism for a lot of its economy. And, you know, I watch what's happening now and people say things like um, Lebanon's, you know, it's being pushed back into the Stone Age and Actually, I think that it's a lens into the future for a lot of the what's considered the global South developing world, even possibly for a future Saudi Arabia, because you're not going to have oil forever and you don't really produce anything else. You do. You can't print dollars, um, but and they still dominate everything in your economy. So I hope I'm wrong to say that. But I feel like for a lot of these countries that especially once you're you ha no longer have any usefulness for American empire, you just kind of 
you know, your corpse gets thrown on the side of the road. And then there's also the two big looming threats, which is these countries are insanely unequal and they have a, uh, an underpopulation mm-hmm. of, of workers, you know, and like maybe maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. But if, you know, who knows, there could be some sort of revolutionary force. In 1788, if you ask the French aristocracy if they were going to last forever, they would have said, yes, these things happen. You don't know when they're going to happen. But even more important than that, you have climate change. You mm-hmm. know, the Middle East is already one of the most difficult places to live on the earth. And you add climate, like horrible climate change into that. And that's going to be an incredibly destabilizing force so you know we might get a few years of financialized capitalism before climate collapse in the region and so right you know this is what we have to look forward to also i really don't know like people say the middle east is hard to live in now like there are parts of the middle east no one should humans should have never lived in like you can't even be there without ac i don't even know how why anyone ever there were transitory (laughs) there were transitory populations you know right i mean like there's there's a reason that the nation state form arose in western europe and not in the middle east right (laughs) because there are different geographic uh and geological things that that push people toward a a certain direction you might see some sort of return to different forms of social organization i mean if you think Mm -hmm. about the nation state that is a western imposition uh right. that is a post-colonial western imposition as a form and it doesn't necessarily mean that now and forever i'd be shocked if in a thousand years the world was divided into nation states you know that, that that's a form that doesn't have to exist for forever so we might see you know different forms of sovereignty arising you know things that we haven't really seen um for um various reasons since world war ii so I want to move back to the U.S. for a moment, um, domestically even, because I think that, that something that's interesting about U.S. foreign policy that doesn't get talked about enough is how it impacts uh, the politics of the United States. And what I mean by that is the sort of blowback. Um, and you actually have covered part of that blowback. Like I, I see groups like you, you've written about QAnon uh, before. And I actually do see a lot of this the, the right wing groups that exist, even the rise of, rise of Trump. I think in so many ways you can pin that on partly blowback to U.S. policy. I mean, you couldn't have had a Trump if you didn't have an ISIS uh, and immigrants, right, or migrants coming to the U.S. fleeing a lot of U.S. backed policies, and ISIS, of course, being blowback um, to U.S. policy in the Middle East, uh, you couldn't have had the uh, the rise of a figure like Trump who fear-mongered off those things without those particular things existing, and they wouldn't exist without U.S. policy. And also um, Trump, I think that a big thing for his early success was calling the Iraq war stupid. And I think that was like mm-hmm. a big thing that like- Yo, Even I cheated. Him. Even I was like so conflicted. I was like, I'm kind of cheer. He was like, but do you remember when he completely just- trash Jeb Bush and was like your brother did the Iraq war and lied I mean who among us wasn't cheering when he did that I was like okay am I cheering (laughs) for Donald Trump I think I am at this particular moment but yeah he really he tapped into a a feeling among a lot of the population that is opposed to a lot of the lies they know they've been told even if they don't they're not quite sure why so yeah that that's I'd like you to speak to that to the issue of how our foreign policy over the last several decades has actually made America, the American populace, more right wing. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it in foreign policy, when you frame the international sphere as one of conflict, almost inevitably promotes racism and xenophobia. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, almost inevitably, when you're talking uh, outside the North Atlantic core, you're going to be dealing with people who are different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different religions, and different races. So that just inherently tends toward uh, towards a right-wing politics, in, in my opinion. Um, moreover, I think it makes the American populace more callous and less empathetic pathetic when you're talking about all of these wars. Uh, You also see what I refer to as imperialist realism, right, which is just the ambient militarism of American life, uh, from flyovers at football games to violent video games based on wars to to violent movies that essentially, and TV shows that essentially present the United States as the be-all, good-all to the Marvel movies, you know, rah-rah Americanism in which the good guy was the CIA agent or the FBI (laughs) agent, which is, of course, reflected in, like, the, the liberal obsession with Comey and um, Mueller and all that stuff. So I think these things just inherently tend toward a right-wing politics. And empire abroad almost always leads to empire at home. So think about militarized policing, right? 
Mm-hmm. This is something that gets going in the 1960s and initially begins, as uh, uh, scholars like Stuart Schrader in his book Badges Without Borders have shown, you know, you, you try a lot of the tactics and strategies abroad first and then you bring them back home to, you know, to, to monitor and surveil, quote unquote, internally colonized peoples like black Americans in the inner city, um, you know, uh, people of, of Latinx descent, etc. And so I think you have um, that sort of boomerang effect mm-hmm. when Governing the world is inherently a liberal and uh, difficult, not difficult, inherently liberal and I would say ultimately evil project. And that leads to a liberal uh, and evil projects at home as well. And I think that's just, again, empir- like empirically true. That's not an opinion. That's something that's been demonstrated time and time again in a variety of different spheres. Yeah. And you I mean to speak to the issue of, you know, trying stuff abroad and then bringing it back home. I mean, the war on terror. Right. Um, not that I'm suggesting I'm not suggesting that the U.S. government is is doing a war on terror against like white supremacists in America. I don't think that that's like ever going to happen. Um, but, you know, the the sort of response to January 6th um, and kind of using the rhetoric that we use towards the rest of the world as now we have to implement these policies internally because of this and comparing it to 9-11. But then, of course, there's also the issue of a lot of these Americans who go abroad and fight in Iraq or Afghanistan coming back and then like joining white supremacist groups um, or becoming neo-Nazis. And then you have these like four, these veterans like shooting things up and just doing crazy lone wolf attacks. Yeah. Empire is a dirty business and it leads to dirty things happening at home. And I think that's been true throughout all imperial history. Yeah, I would love to see that become more of a talking point on the left because I feel like foreign policy is oftentimes really left out of a lot of the conversations because people think that nobody cares about it, but there's so many ways you can connect it to what's happening domestically. You know, not just the fact that we spend so much, like an insane amount of money policing the rest of the world, but also just the ways that it connects to politics at home. But, you know, the other thing I wanted to touch on with you is the issue of identity politics and how it plays out in foreign policy under liberals. Um, it, it was, it played out in a big way under Obama, uh, especially with him being, you know, the first black president and it kind of like shutting a lot of people up and criticizing his foreign policy, even though he continued to do all of the same things that were happening before. And he collapsed, he helps, he helped collapse several States, uh, like Libya and partially Syria. Um, but the issue of like, Joe Biden having the most diverse cabinet and putting these people in power, like Samantha Power, again, is the head of USAID. You have this woman, Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's the ambassador to the UN, who I actually uh, heard her in a press conference discussing what's happening in Ethiopia. And she was kind of like implying that we needed to intervene, although that's not really stated US policy. And the way she implied that at the Security Council was, do African lives not matter? And I was like, I was like, whoa, right, just exactly. the weaponization. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, all these things, all, all, I mean, again and again and again and again, radical political rhetoric gets domesticated by the American state. And this is something that's been going on for a long, long, long time. And you're, I mean, it's not a surprise that in the age of Black Lives Matter, you're not, you're now going to have this, just like you have woke capitalism. Uh, and just if you have like the CIA woke ad, you're going to see this, the, the, deployment of language, this sort of woke language for inherently liberal purposes. And we're already seeing that right now. And I actually think that's a really interesting historical question because, um, you know, traditionally before the last 30 years, foreign policy was really a white male dominated field. What's happened in the last 30 years is you had the, uh, you have the rise particularly of um, um, women, um, most white, mostly white women, but not totally, you know, Madeleine Albright, Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, Condoleezza Rice, Samantha Power, Anne Marie Girl Slaughter. power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the sort of girl, girl boss to, to a real degree, uh, liberal internationalism. And I think that's an interesting question about, you know, um, just as a historian, you know, what is uh, the gender politics of the foreign policy establishment or national security state? How does that play out? And how does that, you know, encourage um, people to take particular uh, particular positions? Um, but I, but what I think has been demonstrated is that, you know, um, liberal imperialism could absolutely be something that's embraced by both genders, uh, that 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 um, that I, I, uh, that identity politics um, uh, show that that if you take identity as sort of a formative thing in someone's life, that that there's a ro- there's a room for imperialism within a variety of different subjective identities, and I think that's been shown across the political spectrum uh, in a variety of ways.
Yeah, and then of course we saw it with this. It's really being embraced, uh, you know, with that CIA woke ad a few months ago that everybody right. was like kind of horrified by. Um, but yeah, it's it's also the kind of woman um, that ends up in these positions is always. And this is, I guess, an assumption on my part or, or an observation on my part. Maybe I'm allowed to say it because I am a woman. But it's always women who are more hawkish than men. Like, it's almost like well, that's the also, only way you can get to that position. It's women you... who are meritocrats, who basically go through a, a lot of the elite educational institutions. So it's not surprising that they share a lot of the assumptions of those institutions, which are liberal hegemonic imperialism. You know, that that is what, you know, if, if one was to say, like, Harvard had a belief in international relations, it would that would be the belief. So I think in that sense, it's related more to the meritocratic sources. Of well, I guess where, where I was where policy. I was going with that is more like if you're a woman, you kind of have to like prove your bona fides by being even harder. Like, it, you know what I mean? Like it's like it's like Hillary Obama Clinton in particular. Of, yeah, has yeah, talked like about that. Yeah. I think in the past. Yeah, yeah. And no, that's, I mean, maybe that's and, me being too generous because it's kind of like saying, "Oh, she's just doing it to fit in with the boys." But to some extent, it's almost like I'm going to prove to you, like I can be as hard as you are, and I'm going to go even harder. Yeah, I think that someone should <laughs> a- analyze, like literally, the documents. Like how are how are these these people who entered these new positions over the last thirty years framing their discussions? Are they are they framing it in terms of like a harder security? Are they framing it in terms of humanitarianism? It'd be very interesting, and I'm sure you'd be able to. You know, uh, historians have shown that gender matters in international <laughs> relations. I'm sure you'd be able to find some really interesting conclusions from just well, analyzing then- what they say. That I'm also kind of reminded, though, because maybe it's like becoming the opposite for men in the liberal sphere. Because remember when Tony, when Anthony, and I'm not his friend, I'm not going to call him Tony. When Anthony Blinken. Tony B. <laughs> when Tony B. <laughs> became, became, was announced as Secretary of State. And I think it was like Samantha Power who tweeted like she was really happy because he's a dad. He's like a new dad. And, and it's like the opposite. It's like where he's trying to soften his hawkishness to kind of like yeah. fit in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just liberal ID politics. They're basically like pantomiming whatever they think they're supposed to do. You know, I think these people, a lot of these people uh, like like Tony Blinken and Samantha Power, what they want is power, <laughs> you know, yeah, and they're going to do what they can to get it. Uh, and so if they have to use sort of the language of liberalism of, of 2021 or 2020 at the time, that's what they're going to do. And so I guess like the question I would want to end on with you, and it's a big one, um, is what does a progressive foreign policy from the U.S. look like? What would it look like? Like if you were advising uh, some some person who took over who had our view of the world, how would you tell them to engage with the rest of the world? It's a good question. And I, I was actually kind of faced with this because I was part of the foreign policy team for Bernie. And mm. so at one point, um, Matt Duss, who was the head of it, is like, what are your like 25 dream things, you know, like blue sky <laughs> thinking. And as I like really sat down to write it, I just realized like, we're going to need, it sounds lame, but we're going to need a lot of like commissions to identify where power lies in this massive structure. Um, the thing that won't be possible to do is just to go in and like start making changes without n- appreciating where power actually lies. So the American imperialist system is incredibly decentralized, just as the American state is incredibly decentralized. Like we're, we're as a state, we rely so much on private uh, contracting. Mm-hmm. You know, we re- rely so much on administrative offices that are effectively outside of democratic control. And that's absolutely true for the American state. So one of the first things we just need to do is like literally find out where power lies, where power is located in this national and international structure. And I think once you you have like an accurate power map, then you could identify weak spots and then you could identify where exactly to attack. But from like a structural perspective, number one is closing down a lot of those bases. You know, I think you got to attack the structure of American foreign policy first and foremost. And the structure relies ultimately on those hundreds and hundreds of military bases. Um, you have to attack the defense budget, um, which ironically, a lot in the military are like, we don't want all this money. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of the defense budget is related to pork. A lot of it's related to local interests and things like that. So you have to build a political economy that's not organized around the military industrial complex. That's a very large order. So I think the way that I would frame it is that you need to you can't just attack the empire. You also have to uh, attack the capitalist political economy at the same there time. And these are projects that work together um, that that operate in parallel that crisscross in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I ultimately want to do, um, I think we have a really good understanding of, of how international capitalism functions. I don't think we have a really good understanding how international capitalism intersects with the security infrastructure of the American empire. 
so I think we need to start thinking along those lines. How do those things interact? How do they work together? How do they, you know, where are the tensions? Where are the, where are the weak points, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good point because the American empire is massive. And you're right. Like, I think that if anything demonstrated how decentralized it is, it really was the, the pandemic. Like the U.S. couldn't even really respond to the pandemic properly at, domestically because of how decentralized everything is. There's no strong There's no center. head to cut off. There's no head to cut off, right? And so this is the problem. So it makes it much, much more difficult to uh, to revolutionize than, than, you know, a monarchical system where you could, you know, Yeah, and you, you can't, ta- and I guess like you said, like you can't really tackle, you can't tackle imperialism, you can't tackle American empire without tackling what's at the heart of it, which is capitalism. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all just an extension of, Making the ah, there's the electricity. Making the world, <laughs> making the world safe for for U.S. you know financial monopolies. Uh, but that said, this was such an awesome conversation. It's gonna come back. Watch one, two. It will eventually. <laughs> um, there it goes. This was such an excellent conversation. That's just a. That's just. I want everybody who watched that. I actually kind of like when that happens when I'm recording, because <laughs> it's like a reminder of what U.S. policies do to a lot of countries, which is. I'm really lucky I have a generator that came on. A lot of people right. don't, and they're just like barely sleeping through the night, you know, sweating without any AC uh, in, in a very hot summer. Um, anyways, Daniel Bessner, where can people follow your work? Uh, well, most important, subscribe, hit hit that, smash that like button. <laughs> smash uh, it! For, <laughs> for uh, American <laughs> Prestige. And I'm on Twitter at dbessner if anyone wants to follow me. Uh, you can get all my hot takes there. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Rania. Really a pleasure.